All right. My guest today is Go Ai Ching, the co-founder of PictoChart. For those of you who don't know, PictoChart is an all-in-one tool to easily create infographics, presentations, reports, posters, and videos online, either from scratch or by editing a broad range of ready-to-use templates. Thank you very much for being here today to discuss this with me. Hey, good. Good to be here, Kevin. Thanks for the invite. Okay, perfect. So the way that I love to start all of these conversations is going back to the origin story. So take me back. How do you start the entrepreneurial journey? And how did you land upon launching PictoChart? Yeah, um, to be honest, completely by accident. Um, I wasn't like, you know, I, I had a job um, and everything. I, I didn't think I was going to become an entrepreneur. So uh, one of the one of the things that led me to the entrepreneurship journey was actually a burnout like in a in a corporate shop and what transpired out of that was um my husband and i then decided maybe you know we need to make money so let's go and start off like a, a you know a web design type of agency um so we built that off very small just hired a couple of designers and developers to work together with us and then um as i was trying to promote our services then i came across infographics and this was like a long time ago like 2010 i think um around 2010, 2011, and we then came across, uh, you know, infographics, and I was like, that looks interesting, like, you know, it could be a, a lead generation of some sort, or, um, yeah, all these visuals are, uh, yeah, are, are good for people to create, so I tried and attempted to create them on Adobe on my own, and I found that process extremely tedious, and I was like, Although that was just in like 2010, 11, I was like, there must be a tool for this. And I, you know, went online and searched it out and there wasn't anything um, out there. So I um, kind of pitched the idea to my husband um, and partner. And then uh, we thought like no harm, you know, giving it a try and having a, an actual product. So then we signed up with China Accelerator. There weren't many accelerators at this time. So it was like Y Combinator, Techstars. I think JFDI in Singapore was in its early days and that was it. So um, we chose China Accelerator because it was, they were very fast moving and, um, and, and then went for the accelerator, had a demo day, you know, as, as launched the product, did lots of PR, lots of pitching around Southeast Asia and fast forward more than 10 years later, like we're here. So <laughs> Yeah, in those days, there wasn't much of a venture capital scene in general throughout the region, even, even uh, within the China market, it was still fairly early days for them, let alone talking about Southeast Asia, yeah? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So for us, it was like flying to the US, um, and, and we knew about Y Combinator and how big they were, but uh, they had two intakes back then, and mm -hmm. you either had to... And plus, it's not easy getting into Y Combinator. So if you don't get in, then we're like, no, we just want to like, you know, get this out to market as fast as possible and not having any startup experience uh, or even knowing, you know, what lean startup meant and things like that. Like we felt like we needed to go yeah, somewhere else <laughs> to, to get that knowledge. Okay. Okay. So who's the, is it, is, I want to be the technical founder or who ended up writing the lines of code? Yeah, it was. Uh, it it still is. Uh, my husband, although today he um oversees a team that does that basically. Uh, but yeah, he is the technical co-founder. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, walk me through the starting phase. So, like, you have the idea, you want to translate it into creating a product. What did it look like in those early days? Were you the test case, or how did you kind of come up with what that MVP was? Yeah. We, um, I wasn't even a designer. We had somebody in-house, a designer that helped us with like, you know, version one, uh, version zero actually. Um, and then we, I ran and I did this survey because that was what they taught us at the accelerator, you know, like take the idea out, don't build it yet. Um, and I just emailed a lot of my past contacts, like from college and university, from, um, from even the, previous workplace that I was at, I was like, if there was such a tool, would you have used it? So kind of asking them, like, I didn't even know how to design a proper survey. So I just did what I could. But the result was that I got about 50% of people who were like, I'm never ever going to use this because, um, you know, either Adobe is better or whatever. Um, and then uh, uh, I had another 50% that were like, I totally would have given this a try. Like, it sounds really interesting. And I felt 50% was good enough, but like I wasn't asking for... 100% of the people to say like, 
um, that they want to use it. And um, at that time, infographics was also just, you know, it was that overly used thing in content marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of popularity it was riding on, like the whole trend of infographics. So um, yeah, I think like it kind of caught a trend at a good time, even though I didn't know all of these things in retrospect. <laughs> Yeah, there was there was a big wave of infographics for a long time to where basically every content marketer, you look at your Twitter feed, you look at any of your social feeds, it's just kind of filled up with these these sort of tools. So it seems, I guess it was a uh, perfect timing for coming up and developing this idea. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so you so you you start building the product and and you, and you 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 did these surveys in order to validate the idea. So. As you're building, was it was it built in house? You said that you had a designer, you, that your that your that your partner is the technical lead. You built it entirely out how in house, and how was that sourcing the tech talent that you needed? Yeah, initially the the prototype that we had in Accelerator, we actually had to outsource the work. So it's with a partner that we've not actually worked again. Um, and and the reason was because we just needed to get a prototype really quickly and. Um, the developers that we hired, we already had clients existing on hand. So like we're like we cannot afford to you know put a stop to all of our existing projects and ruin our reputation. <laughs> um. Uh, so instead, we actually outsourced uh, this like initial prototype. But once that got off, um, and you know passed demo day, and we needed to continue building it in house, then we actually hired dedicated developers who were. So we kind of split the company into like, um you know, the ones who were servicing clients and that was actually helping us generate money and that, you know, obviously we don't make revenue immediately. And then um, there was uh, shared resources of like designers in between um, of the teams. But then we started hiring um, dedicated developer. I think it was one developer actually at the beginning, like just to get that uh, thing going. And we were extremely fortunate because due to the extreme low burn rates, like of, you know, sharing resources and whatnot, um, we were like profitable by like six months actually. So then from that point onwards, it was just reinvesting whatever we made um, and hiring and expanding the team really quickly. So, um, and, and that was like, I know that's not a very normal uh, scenario. Like, I, yeah, try to help friends like replicate that scenario. It's mm -hmm. very difficult, but- uh, Profitable but in, in six case, months we is lucky, pretty think, rare. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But we also kept our burn rates extremely low and- I didn't want to have to worry about money. So like I mentioned, we had the, that agency set of stuff help mm -hmm. us, you know, like we, we still had cash flow that was going in and out and we were, um, I, I didn't have to worry so much about people's salaries, if that makes sense. Uh, okay. So that like the, the 2012, um, that founding year was the hardest, uh, but it was also the year we hit profitability and many other things. And then 2013 onwards, it was like scaling and, you know, growing and learning, making tons of mistakes. But 2012 was like the miracle miracle year <laughs> that that yeah. happened yeah the 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 initial time periods is 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 pretty tough but you you essentially use the agency and the cash flow generated from that to kind of fund the development of picto chart to where you went out of pocket you kept the burn rate low but it wasn't like dipping into savings was it i did dip into savings um for a bit and my founder and like my my co-founder uh, and husband and myself, we didn't really pay ourselves anything, almost mm -hmm. anything, uh, for like eighteen months. I cannot remember. I I think it was around eighteen months. Um, yeah. like something bare minimum just to get going. So there was a lot of like dipping into savings, and plus, being in a service line and having Malaysian clients mostly, you know how payment terms are like. Like you ask for you know net ninety, <laughs> and they they go net I don't know hundred fifty or something. So. Um, like payments were always late, so we had yeah. to dip into um savings for a bit. But like I mentioned, twenty twelve was the harder, you know, twenty eleven and twelve actually were the harder years in terms of cash flow. But after that, like I like we kind of got the gist of how things went and how things ran, and then we we managed, you know. <laughs> so um um yeah, we didn't really like dip into savings as much out of that. Okay. Okay. So the, t tell me about the, the initial customer acquisition. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned that most of the clients were, were in Malaysia. I, I'm assuming that may be more the agency side, or perhaps it's the starting point in 2012 as well. 
how did you go to market and and start and start getting people aware? I know you did the survey, so you had some some existing list. You have the agency, so you have some contacts and networks. But as you start expanding that, how's the customer acquisition in the early days, the zero to a hundred, zero to a thousand stage? Yeah. Um. Again, like from China Service, there was like you know, the demo day and there were like journalists uh, and, and people, you know, in China and um, I wouldn't say necessarily worldwide, but they were covering some of our news. And once coming back, like I started writing a lot of content because back then infographics was, I mean, were for content marketing. So we have to eat our own dog food, obviously. Mm. So we <laughs> said that, you know, in marketing and content marketing and infographics were the way to go. We needed to start creating a lot of them. Um, So that was what we did. And then, uh, pitching around like Southeast Asia. So I was at this event, that event, like everywhere, just trying to get the word out. Um, but that was helpful because we met a lot of skeptics and a lot of people who said like, this idea is not going to work and why and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but all of these things, like small things, like lots of PR mentions and all that actually helped us to get the word out. Um, and then after, I think, uh, about a year in, we were already ranking for the keyword infographic and like in the top, you know, one to three positions for most keywords, infographics, and that SEO actually helped us a ton. So a lot of it was organic. And again, you know, when I was writing those blog articles back then, we didn't even know about SEO or how important it was. <laughs> it was all just like, okay, let's write this for the sake of um you know, for the sake of like getting information out, like, you know, uh, trying to share how infographics work and why they can work for different businesses. Um, and yeah, and, and yeah, so it just went like almost purely by PR and uh, marketing, which later turned into SEO for us. Okay, okay, okay. And when you started implementing that, did by nature that start having a global audience reading those blog posts, seeing that PR, and then getting interested in and driving that inbound traffic towards your website? Or was it more localized because the, the PR for China Accelerator and that is more regionalized? Um, so initially it was quite regional, like it was Southeast Asia primarily that heard about us mm -hmm. and then very quickly once we started like I think ranking on Google like the you know the market was international um so it like it went I, I remembered our first customer the one who paid it was a uh, an immigration like um lawyer from Hong Kong um and that was like you know the the first month that it was a uh, something that wasn't totally uh, regional and it was not even Malaysian, I think from the beginning in the sense of our customer base. Um, today, of course, it's, you know, it's even more um, based in English speaking countries because that's where uh, our, like, yeah, the, the concentration and bulk of our users are. But um, yeah, I, I would say that it started off regional, but within a couple of months, almost it became like international when we started ranking on Google. Okay. What's, what's out of curiosity, kind of jumping, for, jumping forward, what's, what's the composition geographically in regards to your user base currently? You, you, say, you say it's English speaking, so I'm going to make an assumption and assume that the majority must be North America simply from population of the English speaking world, yeah? Yeah, that's right. So um, in terms of users, like free users, I would say about 40-50% are from like Canada and America alone. And then you have, um, you know, you have a lot of Spanish speaking countries like forming that from Latin America and okay. then uh, Europe, like, you know, and Asia in total, like it's about 10%, like, <laughs> so it's not, yeah, it's not a lot. And Malaysia even less actually. Um, okay. And, and it's almost the same proportions in revenue. Okay. Interesting. Any insight into why Asia makes up such a small proportion or... Is it just more of like the marketing skews that direction? Um, so we have tried, I wouldn't say, like we've tried not very successfully with internationalization. So just being able to, uh, in terms of payment gateway now, we are localized. Like, so if you were in the UK, you will see it in pounds. And if you were, mm -hmm. yeah, um, if you were in Europe, you would see in euros. Um, also because we have to comply with like sales tax and VATs and whatnot I am. in different so that part is taken care of but um, what I mean is like the localization the translation of the entire 
um, from website promotional materials all the way to um, the the editor part of things. And we um, we do have a certain part of the website now in Spanish because that's our second largest like you know um, user base uh, at the moment. But we yeah like to go into Asia you would need Mandarin you need like you know Bahasa Indonesia and then you like there's Vietnamese and like it the list keeps going on. Um, and we've not been currently that successful at like going into that. Although that is one of our like bigger priorities this particular year to um be able to at least in terms of like promotional materials to have that um yeah have that out in like different yeah different languages okay so let, let's let's flip back to the to these early days because I'm, I'm really interested in how the evolution of the company ends up happening so you start getting pr you start getting all the inbound you kind of stumble into the seo by getting the word out there that starts driving inbound i'm assuming the product has gone through some evolutions over the course of time you have a broad range of templates you've now got different sorts of uh things that things that you can do from infographics to presentations take me back to the kind of the earliest stages which i'm assuming is 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 going to be a little bit more rough and you're kind of going off intuition how was it in those early days and how have you evolved uh through to today yeah well back then we were laser focused on only offering infographics like literally only infographics it took us quite a while to offer beyond that and i like again, a lot of these things like we didn't even know. You know, back then it was like it's um we were like, yeah, we're an infographic editor and that's you know what we're gonna be. And we maintained that laser focus for a couple of years, which was good maybe because then we solidified like what we were and why we were, you know, playing in the market and things like that. Um and then later on, you know, with Canva coming on board and the whole market just became like all boundary lines were they were blurred, like there was not anymore an infographic editor. Suddenly it became a graphic editor or design, like mm. a graphic design type of like app that could do everything. Um, and that was when we were obviously under a lot of pressure to kind of add on more what we call formats or different categories of designs. Um, but we've always, even until today, maintained that we're not going to do everything because one, we're under-resourced compared to like very large players like Canva. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we're kind of still going deep on the whole information design path. So we then add on like, for example, diagrams, flowcharts, um, things that would help you to tell your story better in a business or a business context. But we try to avoid as much as possible the things like business cards, which I'm, I'm not saying there's no story to be told on your business mm. card, but truth to be said, it's a lot more graphic and, you know, a lot more aesthetics um, than it is about information transfer. So we have done our best to stay on course and stay on par with the whole. And, and that's the one thing that hasn't changed, even though we've now offered a lot, a lot more categories. Um, so that, yeah. And, and even the, the roadmap, everything that we're doing today is still, it's not focused on infographics because we think that's too limiting. Um, even Instagram carousels these days are infographics mm -hmm. to a certain extent. They're a listicle of like, you know, very... You have information, you're trying to make it really concise, you're ordering it or designing it in such a way so that it gets attention. Um, so we're we're still like investing heavily in that path and making sure that you know communication becomes very clear visually. Um yeah, that, that's the part that didn't change, but the part that changed is obviously we've added on a lot, a lot more formats and categories to be competitive with, you know, other players that are out there. Okay. And and what about on the editor side as well? Because there there's a, there's an aspect of ease of use and all of that. I, I have to imagine that that side of it has also gone through some iterations. Yeah. How, how do you get, you know, when, when you, when you do edits to those sort of features, especially on the editor side, or even on the different features, how do you end up trying to figure out what to do and why? And, and again, I assume this has evolved over time from uh, throughout the business life. Yeah. Yeah, we've done also a lot of mistakes. Like the first, I remember the first mock-up that we had, it said like step one, two, and three, like literally it was built into the left panel. Um, Quite funny, but it worked, you know, because it was like, <laughs> it was really KISS. Uh, it's super simple and everybody got it. Um, And then we evolved it and then we went for a more minimalist where you had like a more full canvas, like uh editor, more similar to Miro, maybe Miro, mm -hmm. Miro, whatever. 
people call like it's full canvas, but it was too early for its day. So we launched that and uh, users hated it because like we tried to give them more space in the editor and less, you know, like menus that popped up everywhere. Yeah. Um, the users hated it. So then we switched back to the whole left panel. And actually, I think the current design, although of course it's gone through like minor iterations, you know, but I feel like it's been that way for at least seven years now. Okay. Um, that whole left thing. So even, you know, the days before Canva did, we already figured out like that was the correct, um, the correct interface to go with because we've tried everything else and the users just seem to hate it. Even when we thought like, this is much better for you, you know, not to have like such a busy looking um, interface and all that. So we tested it the hard way, um, to be honest, because there was no way of finding out what, you know, what users would like or dislike. Um, and yeah, and, and that was like the earlier days, like all the mistakes and everything that we did. Um, today, we're doing our best to uh, save that effort by just going through like without coding it, like just with a Figma prototype or something, like mm -hmm. taking that to the user and testing that reaction before we even like start building it because it's too expensive to be mm. iterating on a new interface and then, you know, not getting much... Um, yeah, likes from it. Yeah, and I imagine with your user base, once you grow accustomed to using something with, you know, left panel, it's etc., changes even if they're relative, seemingly minor, can actually get some some you know heated feedback. Let's say, yeah. That's right. That's right. So we learned a lot of this like in the earlier days. So today, even if we were changing, it's like we do gradual changes, like uh you know, moving one element and then letting that sit for a month and then moving the next element because yeah. any big change would surely like create a huge reaction. Um, And you're right, like users hate change. Like no matter how good it is for them, like they just hate change. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. And how how is it as, as well? Because, you know, the, the, the outlets by which you're distributing information has evolved along this, this lifespan of your company as well. You know, different sorts of avenues, whether Facebook has gone up and down, Twitter has gone up and down. You have LinkedIn getting more on the on the professional side. More professionals are starting to use TikTok, etc. How have you seen the need to evolve your product along the evolution of the means for distribution? That that's a good question. And the thing that um that you know we always talk about internally is that we're not actually a tool that's very good for um social media. So we're not like, you know, not like Canva. So Canva is like, its success was based on um, social media graphics, actually, like more. And of course, or like print stuff, like, you know, posters, banners, et cetera, like all, all of those. But for us, because we started off with something very information-based, um, a ton of our users actually download these in PDF format and then distribute them. And it's a workplace um type of usage it's not for marketing or distribution purposes we created picture chart more than 10 years ago for the sake of content marketing like for that jobs to be done but today and when we looked into what our users were actually using it for they were sharing information dense type of like reports mm -hmm. um sometimes even dashboards or presentations and that was going internally or going out to clients but it wasn't at a type it's not the type of report you would put on social media at all um, and because of that, we've been relatively uh, independent from all of the, you know, the trends that were going on because that's, you're talking about a simple PDF. <laughs> um, and also like we, we just had to catch up with the ways that people were actually sharing like private confidential reports internally within organizations. So that was the part that we needed to change and evolve, but not, and, and collaboration, you know, making the tool a lot more collaborative. Um, that was the part we needed to evolve a lot more rather than, you know, following all of the social media trends because that's actually not our strong suit. Okay. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about the collaborative features then. What, what, what did you, how did you start out and how, and how does it look today in regards to allowing team members, et cetera, to collaborate? Yeah, we got feedback and actually even until today, we still know that there are a lot of our users that, um, that share usernames and passwords and mm. they would they would tell us that and be like, oh, our file is lost. Like, you know, someone deleted it. And we're like, hey, we're we're not the ones who, <laughs> who helped to create that. Like if you mm. have too many users locked in at the same time, um, using one same account, like that's bound to happen. Um, so 
uh, that, you know, like we, we heard that type of like pain point. So we were like, okay, obviously it's an opportunity for monetization. So then um, I think that the very, very early stages, it was just being able to add on like a different team member and you're um, able to edit the file, not simultaneously. So like being able to kind of, um, yeah, like, you know, have a shared like workspace. And then later on, we we evolved, and this is so much more right now. Like there's a branding kit this quarter. We're working on refining that branding kit, like where you can upload multiple brand colors and mm -hmm. you know um swatches and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so that the the teams would be able to have like full control and say like I only, you know, sometimes in larger organizations they only want their employees to be using a certain set of like brand colors, brand fonts. Um, so we're going into like really granular control today as well as like sharing permissions, like there's a lot of um, what we're working on next is more around control. So like uh, a, a lot of these things now, they're available on PictoChart, but you're not able to ask an admin say, I want to have control so that they only use these templates, these colors, these fonts, this, you know, um, et cetera. So those are, um, yeah, it's it's evolved to even more levels. Um, like we would have an admin and then team member. And today there's like admin, there's finance position, like, they, you know, all of these things that the larger um, organizations would require. So um, yeah, like basically we evolved based on necessity whenever larger users tell us like, hey, you're missing this mm -hmm. or even log in via SAML. Uh, I, I don't even know what it stands for. But <laughs> um, SSO type of uh, logins for larger organizations. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, so we've built those like whenever the, you know, whenever a number of like larger users request for those things, then we understand that they're important and we keep building them so that collaboration becomes seamless for, uh, or security becomes, you know, uh, and we're complying with security from their side as well. Okay. Okay. So let, let, let me tie this back to kind of the pricing model and, and how the subscription packages are, because it, it's starting to sound like you have some larger enterprises that are likely on a little bit more customized subscription packages, whereas you, you probably as well have entry points for a freemium model that can kind of scale up from there. Can you tell me about how, how that's kind of started and, and where it is today along the kind of this, the same evolution yeah. of collaboration, et cetera? Yeah. We're unfortunately not very evolved on our pricing. That's also one of our weak points. Um, we've tried different pricing points to test, like, so we did surveys as well to test um pricing elasticity, mm -hmm. and then um uh, afterwards we implemented it. But as you would expect, whatever you get from surveys is not what you would get in real life. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, we only have right now a free tier, um, a pro tier as well as an enterprise tier. So you're right that the enterprise tier is a lot more customized. We you know, look at the size of the team and then what they require. Sometimes we throw in like custom templates and things like that. Um, but we're actually looking at introducing a new tier uh, to our suit because we've realized also that um, not all users are made equal. And like you've already rightfully uh, noticed that we do have certain organizations that are slightly bigger. They don't necessarily buy like, you know, a hundred seats um, at one go. Like it could be 20, it could be mm -hmm. 10. Um, it could be less like five, but the, their needs are significantly different from the individual user who may be like, I'm a coach or a consultant and I'm using this, you know, on my own and I'm not sharing this with anyone mm -hmm. else. Like their use cases are extremely different. So suddenly like um, even branding components or kits are a lot less important to them um, and, and all that. So we're actually trying to build a different tier now um, to kind of have the features that would make sense for um, the individual like pro user, like a prosumer basically, and mm -hmm. the ones who are, they are more collaborative because currently we're not differentiating them. Like they're all together and we've realized like we're probably leaving money on the table um, and like, you know, vice versa, I, I don't know, probably not making it affordable enough for the prosumer. Um, therefore, yeah, at some point um, in this year, we'll also have to test on that. But we, um, a lot of our thinking is always based on, you know, looking at, um, our, our user base, like the feedback that we're getting, because uh, we do have an MPS still a survey, although it doesn't mm -hmm. play much the metrics that we're not monitoring MPS for the sake of the metric, but more so for the feedback, et cetera. And um, whenever we get, you know, like uh, like more significant feedback around a certain group, uh, and then we'll look at that particular area, whether it be pricing or, um, you know, icons, illustrations, that, that one, or, or templates, like it, insufficient or whatever it is that we'll, you know, we'll keep looking into those areas and investing accordingly. 
Um, but pricing is one area, like I mentioned, that we're actually quite, we should be more evolved, but we're not. <laughs> okay, but that's 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 on the agenda for 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 for, for coming up and yeah. and looking at evolving a new new subscription package based upon the feedback. You yeah. mentioned yeah. one thing about metrics, and I, and I'm I'm quite curious of how you approach this because, you know. When you start digging down, you can end up getting overwhelmed by the variety of metrics that you could potentially be analyzing. How do you as an organization approach metrics and how perhaps has that kind of evolved over time as, as the company has matured? Yeah, we um, started off like measuring almost everything. We still measure everything and we just mm. call them like what metrics. Like you don't need to know, like if I've launched a new chart, I need to know how, you know, like what's the engagement, like what's the engagement among our pro users, like, you know, who who are the ones who are adding more charts, like mm -hmm. what's average number of charts that, you know, a person adds, like, so all of these numbers are important to us, but then at the bigger um, level, uh, company level, like I, I told my team, it's always been about, it really is about revenue because we're bootstrapped and we cannot afford to, like, we're not like, okay, let's grow our monthly active users and that's it. Like it has, there has to be a, you know, it has to come down to a, a bottom line. And almost the profitability and you know dollars and cents. So um at every quarter or almost every year now, actually, we stick to a particular goal, whether it be increasing, I don't know, conversion rate, retention rate, acquisition, something, and sometimes two of these metrics, like large ones. And then from the the large metrics that we've picked as an organization, there is a dashboard that tracks all of this. And we sometimes even zoom into one particular user like persona almost where we, we said like, this is the year we're going to grow this segment um because you can't grow them over a quarter or try to make any meaningful changes to the metrics in a quarter. So then we um we rationalize like why, you know, how much are they like bringing in right now and why, what we're trying to grow this segment into. And then um that that's like the overall company guide. We use OKRs for this. And then the teams would then build and track their, whether it be experiments or initiatives based on that to see if we're making any meaningful changes and movements towards that particular metric. And um, so in, in general, like I said, the companies like OKRs or metrics almost don't change in the entire year because mm -hmm. we find that it takes a long time to make any meaningful change to anything, whether it be retention, dollar retention, or better. worse, I think it's dollar retention because that takes a long time. <laughs> yeah, to um, realize, but, yeah. Yeah, um, but if it's acquisition, sometimes you can get it done in one or two quarters, but uh, that... Then all of the teams, like I said, they built their OKRs based off that. So kind of like say how we're going to contribute towards, you know, increasing whatever the metric is by X percent. Um, so that's the way we work. And my job is basically just to strategize and like figure out a, a story or rationale to tell the company why mm -hmm. we have picked this metrics and why we're going to stick with it, why it's going to help us. Um, and then it's the job of the rest of the teams to figure out how they're going to help us, you know, get there. Um yeah, so that, that's been the way we've worked. In the beginning, we were a lot more lost because we had tons of like input metrics, like, you know, engagements of all sorts, like everything in the, yeah. <laughs> in the app we're measuring. And then today, we're, it's a lot more stable. Like people know what to look for. They know how to read reports. They know everyone has access to dashboards. And um, every week, at the start of the week, they have um, a, a breakdown of like revenue financials, like even week on week, like what went mm -hmm. well, what didn't. As well, the product, um, the product managers also write like a, a literal, you know, like, okay, these are monthly active users compared to last year. What trends are we seeing that's different? Or we're acquiring more of this type of users. Wonder why? Did anyone do any, anything different? So all of these things kind of happen asynchronously via Slack or um, once and twice, no, actually twice a month, we have a like a, a Zoom gathering like this, like a, almost an all hands where a lot of this data and information gets um, pushed out. So uh, we, we want people to be on the same page and not just to be like surprised, you know, when something happens. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And how big is your team at this point in time? We're pretty small, actually. We've um, more or less intentionally kept ourselves. Right now we're at 30. And um, and I find that, you know, there's a, I, I've heard this before, like um, there's a certain size. The company at one point was actually at 60 people. And I found that each time we hit around that number, we kind of gradually like downsized almost all the way to like about 40 plus. And I kept wondering why that was until I, I read an article somewhere and it was saying that every founder almost has a fit for a certain like, you know, size of the organization. And I think that 
like around this size is actually our sweet spot, like between 30 to 40, not more. It's probably our sweet spot. Whenever we grow larger than that, like it's almost like, I don't know how to put it, like some quite a number of things fall apart. Um, and I've learned to embrace it now because back then I was always trying to push the ceiling and be like, oh, we need to be bigger. We need to, you know, and I started realizing throwing more warm bodies at the problem don't help to solve the problem. So <laughs> it's just a matter of like um, having a certain flywheel, a certain speed that we're used to and happy with and to keep, you know, toiling yeah, uh, at, at that level and that speed instead of trying to push yourselves to do more. Okay. Okay. And are you all based in uh, Penang there or are you remote working out of different locations? Yeah, out of different locations, a large uh, group of us are based in Penang, but um, mm -hmm. also quite a, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people scattered all over. Okay. Okay. And how do you, how do you manage the, the, the remote work? I know a lot of people got pushed into it. Perhaps you were working that way prior to uh, the yeah. COVID period. Is it is it a lot of asynchronous communication, doing all hands meetings from time to time? Or how how do you manage that and keep the cohesion of the team? Yeah, I think for Pick the Chat, the story is like really different because we used to have an office for um six seven years until the pandemic, and then um then we were forced anyway to all go remote for at least two years plus. And um, but even before then, we've already had like you know people working with us from Europe, from the US, so we were used to lots of like different time zones and um you know and like to default to uh, either a video or written communication uh constantly um but when it got to you know when it got to the pandemic and we had to make a choice like between like do we want to go back to the office or do we want to like go on you know remote forever and i i was like i really see no harm in productivity if anything i almost felt like there is an people especially during the pandemic like we were overly working <laughs> mm -hmm. that was burnt out from um, too much of work uh, and that caused us to like then move into a four-day work week but it was um I, I saw the opposite effect like what people were most worried about oh productivity is going to go down and I was like it's the opposite for us like we were all like way too burnt out like everyone was working too hard during um, that period of time and then we just said like to make things uh, at uh, level for everyone from different parts of the world it was a lot fairer if we just went completely remote um, so then since we learned how to work um, we already had a lot of foundations in place to be honest like all hands we, we knew what kind of like cultural activities you know to do mm -hmm. um, how to bond and all that kind of stuff but um, the part that that got I felt strengthened a lot more was actually we cut down even more on meetings and that forced everyone to be extremely good communicators and um uh and you know like documentation just became plenteous like it, it wasn't you know before that because you could whenever you had a question you just like sit up next to someone knock on their like tap on the shoulders and then um ask them a question so you don't have the need to document anything but now we actually like document a lot like every at every level of the organization there's a lot of documents and it forces clarity of thinking, which I love. And I felt that it's actually helping to save time a lot. Like, because otherwise you'll be spending the first 15 minutes of a meeting explaining things that should have been communicated in just a couple of pages of, you know, written document. Um, and we practice that a lot now. I, I know that Amazon and a couple more companies do it, mm -hmm. but I, I and actually believe in that because um, I've seen how it, it forces clarity of thinking uh, mm -hmm. within people. It's actually helping them do better work and more productive work instead of like sitting there being quiet while somebody explains information for like 15 minutes and everyone's on mute. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's interesting how the, the evolution has happened. And I think the, the, the way that you're, that you're going about it, making sure that you're utilizing your time in the most productive of manners. Cause otherwise meetings can be a huge time suck. Uh, and next thing you know, a lot of, a lot of your productive, productive hours have now, disappeared um yeah. let, let me let me shift and, and and do something a little bit more forward looking so you had talked about a couple of the initiatives and things that you wanted to work on such as the pricing model you talked about some of the localization with languages etc when you look forward over the next year or perhaps even further out what are what are the key initiatives what's the what's the future hold for picto charter what are your priorities right now 
Yeah. So we're still like we we felt that the work is definitely not done in the whole like you know business storytelling space. Um, almost, you know the the parts that I mentioned unto you. Um, I have a process and I'm trying to make this visual. How do I communicate that in a you know in a really smart way? Um, and helping to get as much information transferred as much as possible. So we're working a lot. Um, we've divided this whole year into like quarters. Each one kind of focuses on one item. Uh, the first quarter is more on branded um, content, like how do we create like more on brand, like the collaboration stuff that I mentioned to mm -hmm. you as well earlier. Um, we're also looking into uh, improving some of our presentation aspects and like compatibility with different tools. So right now we have the ability, for example, to export into PowerPoint. Um, and we're like, well, could we also help to import from, you know, different sorts of like uh, sources, I don't know, documents and things like that, where you could then uh, translate those into visuals like pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking into compatibility between like entrenched tools basically and us. And then um, the, the third quarter is primarily actually about storytelling. Again, we already have a lot of charts and maps, but we want to further improve on its functionality so that we could not just visualize more complex data, but um, make it, you know, make it a lot more seamless for people to add on um, diagrams, flywheels, whatever, like, you know, uh, like work related and information related, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, like a person who goes like, I have this five bullet points. What are the ways for me to visualize this apart from five bullet points? So that's like the storytelling thing that we're working on. And finally, integrations, because um, our users, they, uh, I, I would say they're not that many of them that come from like startup environment. There's quite a bit that comes from more conventional um setups where they're used to certain tools and integrations there would really make sense for um these people to be working on their business documents so uh in short that's like kind of the year we're still digging in and you know trying to uh build more and more and more in in the realm of information design or business storytelling so where um yeah though from a product perspective those are the things that we're focusing on Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Well, you got a busy year coming up. It's it sounds like so. We're all, I'm sure, I'm sure we're all anxious to see see what that comes out to. Let me wrap up here with my final closing questions that I ask everyone. And the first one is, what is a tech tool that you just cannot live without? Um, I thought about it, and I actually think I'm gonna go with Google Keep. It sounds very like. You know, I, I don't even know what people think about it, but um, for me, it's my it's my Evernote. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was a user of Evernote, and then I yeah. I left it because I I couldn't figure out like many things. But the thing about Google Note is that it's installed in everyone's phone like almost by default. Um, I find it easy to like take notes. Um, I you know my checklist, my to dos, um, even my reflections, my mm. you know my journals, everything. It's like all in one place, and I still have a way to organize it. So um. Um, that's the one thing I feel like, yeah, a simple tool, but I kind of live off it right now. Okay. Okay. And last question here, if you were to talk to another founder, that's just getting started out, what would be your biggest piece of advice? Uh, you know, I used to say like, validate, validate and validate. But right now I think I might go with like live life backwards, like in the sense, um, know as a founder, how big you want to be. Um, and what you're willing to put into uh, the business to like get it to grow there uh, and like just knowing the end helps you a lot with your your now and your current and the reason why I said that is because I felt like I didn't have a very clear picture about where we wanted to be how big we wanted to be and all that kind of stuff um, from the get-go in the beginning and that has cost us um, like I feel like sometimes I'm chasing dreams of a, a person, like a, a different person. And that has been, I, I, yeah, it's been time wasting. Like I should have just stuck with what I knew we were going to be and what, you know, our ambitions were um, for the organization. And that was it. Okay, fantastic. Perfect advice for another founder out there. Well, Ajing, thank you very much for being here. This has been a great conversation as we, as we navigated through the evolution of, of PictoChart. I very much appreciate it. All right, that wraps it up for another fantastic episode of The Sea of Startups. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend, 
go on to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. It's the best way for us to get discovered and to have these startup stories reach a broader audience. If you have any suggestions or would like to get in touch, you can email me at kevin at indelible.vc. As always, I'm your host, Kevin Rockland from Indelible Ventures, and this is the Sea of Startups.